we find the story of the testing of Jesus in the wilderness in Matthew and Mark and Luke. For whatever reason, John does not include it in his gospel. But right after Jesus was baptized, he is tempted by Satan. So of all the things that we do not have in common with Jesus, being tested and tried and tempted is one of those things we do have in common with him. So let us listen for the word of God, for this is God's word to each of us this day. Now Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days, and when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. And then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, to you I will give their glory and all this authority, for it has been given over to me, and I give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourselves down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to protect you, and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, as we come to you this morning, some of us are in places of darkness. Some are in shadows. Some feel like they're on the verge of a new day. You, O oh Lord, know our hearts. And so I pray that through these words, you will speak to each one of us as we need to hear. We pray this in Jesus' name, and all God's people said. I heard a story about when Vince Lombardi was the coach of the Green Bay Packers. And Lombardi had this rule that if a player was caught out after midnight before a game day, he would be fined $125. Now, this was when $125 seemed like a lot of money. And he had one player who kept breaking this rule, a player named Max McGee. And so Max McGee was caught out after midnight and he was fined $125. Well, he did it again. And the second time he was caught out after midnight before a game, he was fined $250. The third time he was caught out after midnight, this time Lombardi called him up on the phone and said, Max, I'm going to have to fine you $500 for being caught out after midnight, and if you stay out one more time, it's going to cost you $1,000. And Max, if you find anything worth sneaking out for worth $1,000, I want you to call me so I can go with you. <laughs> Temptation is one of those things that we all have in common. We are probably all tempted by different things, but being tempted is a human experience. Tell a man that there are a billion stars in the skies and he will believe you, but tell that same man that the paint on a door is wet and you will have to touch it just to be sure. 
And sometimes this temptation to do something wrong, it happens so quickly that we fail the test even before we know we're taking it. We don't invite this temptation, it's just, it's right there in front of us. You know, we're walking down the street and we see a beautiful woman in front of us and we realize we're staring longer than we should. Or we see something we like in a stranger's yard and we wonder to ourselves, oh, I, I wonder if they'd miss it if I took that. Or someone hurts our feelings and before we even realize it, our first thought is how we might hurt them back. So my guess is we've all had these kinds of temptations or other kinds. These thoughts enter our minds so quickly that we don't even know what we're doing before we start doing something wrong. Long time ago when I first started out in the ministry I had a friend who invited me to his ordination into the Catholic ministry. We were all invited to come forward for communion. Now, my, since my friend had asked me to come, I assumed that Protestants were welcome. Well, I was wrong. I stepped into the line and when it came my turn to receive the sacrament, I stepped up to the priest. Now, I don't know what I did or what I didn't do that I should have done to appear like I should have been there, but I didn't do it. And the priest looked at me very sternly and said, are you Catholic? And like a deer caught in the headlights, I lied and said, yes. <laughs> and I was so embarrassed, not for taking communion, but for telling a lie. Those kinds of temptations happen to us I suspect we're not looking to do something wrong. We don't intend to do evil, but suddenly we find that we are. The great reformer, Martin Luther, wrote about temptation. He said, we can't help the birds that fly above our heads, but we can help them from nesting in our hair. We can't stop a flash of anger, a sudden desire for revenge, or a momentary thought of envy, but we can stop them from nesting. Just because a bad thought enters our mind doesn't mean we have to hold on to it. And so that's that. Really, temptation is familiar to us all, each in our own way. But there's something unfamiliar about this temptation story with Jesus. See, the temptation story with Jesus, it doesn't just happen by a fluke, right? Jesus doesn't just wander into the wilderness. He sure doesn't end up there because of a series of poor choices. Luke says that after Jesus was baptized and after that dove came down and after he heard the voice of God calling him the beloved, Luke says the Spirit led him into the wilderness. Satan did not lead Jesus into the wilderness. God did. Now I looked up this Greek word here in Luke where it says led by the Spirit. That word led by means to be captive. Jesus was grabbed by the Spirit and pulled into the wilderness. The Gospel of Mark is even more direct. Mark says that the Spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness. Jesus was shoved into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit. He didn't get there because of a series of wrong turns. So the question of the day, of course, is why would God send Jesus to a place where God knew he would face temptation. 
Wouldn't God want to keep Jesus away from temptation? And so why drive Jesus into a wilderness where God knew Satan was waiting? Now I also notice that this Greek word for temptation can be translated as testing. Testing. In other words, God sent Jesus into the wilderness to test him. Now, from what I remember in college, there are basically two kinds of tests. The first kind of test, it seems like our professors would come up with these very obscure questions that were somehow meant to trip us up and make us feel dumb. Or maybe it was just me that felt dumb, I don't know. But, but then there were the second kinds of questions, a second kind of test in which the questions were actually about things that we really did need to know. And these tests prepared us for the world. We needed those tests, really. And so I wonder if the temptations that Jesus had to face in the wilderness were of that second kind. The kind of test that wasn't meant to trip him up, but really meant to prepare him for what he would have to face later on. And look at that very last verse from the story today. After Satan tries and fails to tempt Jesus, Luke says, quote, when the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. In other words, Satan wasn't done with this testing business. He was coming back. Satan may have failed this time, but it would not be the last time Jesus would have to face a Satan who would try to mislead him. So I think this wilderness was meant to forewarn Jesus. They were meant to prepare him for the things that lay ahead so that when they happened, he'd be ready. I mean, granted, none of us like tests of any kind, right? But they get us ready for things we have to deal with. I mean, think about it, whether it's a math test or a history test or a driver's test or an MRI or a colonoscopy, you name it. All these tests give us information that's meant to help us. They prepare us. And I think God sent Jesus into the wilderness to show him the kind of trials that were coming his way. So he'd be ready. And in fact, the story reveals it was true. That all these temptations Jesus faced in the wilderness, all of them were ones he did indeed face. And yet, in all of them, he made the right choices. He created bread and he fed people. He performed miracles that led people to faith. He was called king of his people and he showed them what it meant to be royalty in the kingdom of God. So this wilderness was not just a bad time, a terrible experience. It was meant to prepare him. Think back to the inoculations we had as children we were given just enough of something bad to build up antibodies so when we came in contact with something bad, we, our bodies would be ready. And that is the kind of testing that we need as people of faith. I was watching a documentary on the Freedom Riders of the 1960s. Before riding down south on buses, they had to endure a week of testing or training in nonviolence. So in this training, the Freedom Riders, they were pushed and ridiculed and insulted. And they went through this trial of abuse so that when faced with the real hardship, they would be ready. So and into this time of Lent, we use this time to prepare ourselves for the kingdom of God. We make conscious choices to test ourselves, to make our faith stronger, 
And so some people decide to go without certain things during Lent. Other people decide to make a special effort to do certain things during Lent. And so whether it's one or another, both of them can be a trial, both of them can be difficult, both of them may be a test, but they can both make our faith stronger. Whether it's going an hour without TV a day or giving special effort to say thank you to people at the store. It's all meant to prepare us for the kingdom, which is exactly what Jesus was doing there in the wilderness. In fact, someone once said, whoever has not experienced temptation cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Because if you've not ever experienced that temptation, you've not really put your faith to work. Think of it this way, faith is like a muscle in our body. And if we don't use our faith, just like our body, it gets lethargic. I know I vis visit people in the hospital, and if they haven't gotten up to move around in about a week, they get terribly, terribly weak. And if they don't put some kind of strain on their muscles, their muscles atrophy. Well, same goes for our faith. We can't avoid these temptations. In fact, we can't avoid them at all. And there's no end to them, not for Jesus, not for us. But maybe if we use our faith to fend off some of these larger, or use our faith to fend off some of the smaller birds of temptation, it'll help us deal with the larger ones that try to nest in our hair. And through it all, my friends, we should be kind to ourselves because we will fail, but we may also get much stronger if we can see that our trials and testing and temptations as inoculations, it, they will not only help us to endure, they will make us stronger in ways we never thought possible. So now we ask God in this season of Lent to grow, give us the growth and wisdom that we need in things that matter. And when we find ourselves at our own particular time of testing, May God send us angels like God sent angels to Jesus to help us through it all, and the sooner the better. To God be the glory forever and ever. Amen.